Hey guys, I'm finally back with a new video, and for those who are wondering, no, I'm not dead. It's been a crazy year, and I've been super busy, so thank you for waiting so patiently, and I promise to start making videos more frequently. So for today's video, I'm going to demonstrate how to trade stocks using AWS, Amazon Web Services, all the while staying within the free tiers of the various AWS services that we're going to use. So when we're all done, we won't have to pay anything to host our code on AWS, and it can just execute without any input from our end. That's the hope anyway. We'll see how close we can get. So, disclaimer. Let's kick things off with saying I am not responsible if you guys end up racking up huge AWS bills. Yikes. Anyway, it's entirely up to you guys to monitor your usage and make sure you really are staying within the free limits. I'll show you later on in the video how to monitor your usage, uh, set up notifications if you're getting close to those usage limits, and how to take down all the infrastructure we'll be creating to help prevent any large unexpected bills. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, this video is split up into two main parts. I'll start with introducing some basic concepts, walking you through the services we'll be using, and then in the second part, we'll hit the ground running and start coding. As always, I'll include the start times for each part in the description below. So if you're familiar with AWS and just want to see the code, feel free to skip ahead. Likewise, you can always find the link to the GitHub repo for this video in the description below. So to start, what is AWS? Well, AWS is a cloud platform that offers over 200 different services. Some of these have free tiers for up to a year after opening your account, and others have permanent free tiers. This is important to pay attention to so you aren't surprised when your free year is up. These can range from simple services like storing your data all the way to the ridiculously complex services like managing your personal fleet of satellites. There are more services being added to the AWS catalog all the time, and I personally am discovering new and cool ways to implement projects. So if you guys disagree with how I've implemented the code in this project, or know of a better way, or new service that I'm not aware of, feel free to let me know in the comments below. Okay, so our next definition is what is Terraform? Well, Terraform is what's called an infrastructure as code software tool, which basically means we can write code to create and manage all aspects of a cloud service we might be using. No need to understand what this means just yet. I'll point things out as we write the Terraform code, and hopefully it'll become more clear as we go along. Just know that it's open source and really easy to get the hang of once you know some basics. Also, it makes it really easy to manage and reproduce your cloud infrastructure. So anyway, that's basically what AWS and Terraform are. Now let's give an overview of which specific services we'll be using in this video and then dive into writing the code. By the way, to try to keep this video from dragging on too, too long, I won't be covering how to create an AWS account or how to install Terraform on your machine. There are already tons of tutorials out there covering both topics at length, and from here on out, I'll just assume that we have both set up. So the AWS services we'll be using are Lambda, Systems Manager, Identity and Access Management, and CloudWatch. Let's start with AWS Lambda. So Lambda is a serverless compute service that lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers. Basically, you can think of it as a virtual machine that will run your code for you, and you don't have to worry about any server configurations, so you can purely focus on creating the code. Let's check out the pricing model for Lambda before we dive into the code, just to make sure that we're sticking to the free services. As we can see, Lambda is one of the services that has an always free tier, as opposed to those that only offer 12 months or a trial. If we dive deeper into the limits of that free tier, we can see that we have 1 million requests per month, 400,000 gigabyte seconds of compute time per month, or up to 3.2 million seconds of compute time. Now, whether or not we can stay within these free limits is of course going to depend on your specific trading strategy. If, say, your strategy demands that you make a request every second of every day and use a bunch of memory and run 15 minutes each time, then you probably will end up surpassing these limits. If, however, you can keep your requests to every 5 or 10 minutes and only during trading hours, then you should be well within these limits and not incur any extra charges. For our purposes though, we can safely say we won't be exceeding those limits, so we should be good to go. With that said, let's jump in and start with the Python code that will be running on the Lambda and executing our trades for us. So I have an example repository created already, and I'll just uncommon code as we go. As I mentioned before, you can go check out this repository for yourself and follow along if you guys want. 
I'll put a link to the repo in the description below. Now keep in mind, this is super bare bones on purpose. I'll leave it up to you guys to add more of a coherent strategy in your own code. Okay, so we're going to first need a couple different libraries. The first of which we'll have to upload with the Lambda in the Terraform code, and the second is already there, provided by AWS. Next, we'll need a handler function, which will be invoked by AWS when it kicks off the Lambda. We can throw in a few print statements just for fun, then we have to access a few environment variables such as the key ID and the secrets key. These will be set in Systems Manager manually through the AWS console later on and passed into this Lambda's environment through the Terraform code. Lastly, we just need to create an API object with our parameters and submit an order. This is an order for one stock, in our case GME, that is good till cancelled, with a limit price, and with no stop price or extended hours trading. And that's it for the Python side of things. If all goes as planned, this Lambda will submit an order for us. Now let's look at the Terraform code that we need. First, we need a provider block to specify which cloud provider we're using. Terraform can be used for multiple cloud providers such as Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, and AWS to name a few. In this, we will set a variable for the region, which is code for a geographic region of the world that would usually just correspond to where your users are. There is a long list of AWS regions available for use, and it really depends which is closer to you. So going back to the code, you can see we are using a variable, which I left in as an example on how to both create and use variables in Terraform. We actually set the variable in a separate file called variables.tf. Because I'm in the US and on the west coast, we'll just set it to US West 2, since that's the closest region to me. Since the variables.tf file is located in the same directory, when we run this, Terraform will be able to find and assign the variable back in the lambda.tf file. Next, we'll need to build the lambda, which we called here the trading lambda. This is just the local name, however. In AWS, it will appear as whatever we set the function name to down here. So there are two different types of lambdas AWS supports, container lambdas and zip lambdas. We are going to use the zip lambda type in this project, which will have some restrictions on the size of the zip file, but I encourage anyone watching to try to use container lambdas if you are filling up for the challenge. If you guys want me to make another video showing how, just let me know in the comments. The reason I chose a zip lambda over a container lambda is because with a container lambda, we would have to pay to host a container image in ECR, which stands for Elastic Container Registry. Now, if we look at the free tier for AWS ECR, we can see that we get, quote, 500 megabytes per month of storage for your private repositories, end quote which would be more than enough for our needs, but this is only for the first year after creating an account. Now, of course, the price is still only 10 cents per gigabyte per month for data stored in private repositories, which would be more than enough for our needs, but it's still not free. And I promised you guys we would get to as close to free as possible. So a zip lambda it is. Anyway, so when we build the zip file for our lambda containing our Python code, we'll need to point to that zip file. That's what we're doing here. We already went over what the function name is, so next is the source code hash. This is basically a base64 encoded SHA-256 hash of the zip file. So if the hash is different, for example if we made any changes to the Python file, Terraform can pick up on that and will trigger an update to the Lambda on AWS. This is calling a data source called an archive file, which we can see down here. We'll get into what data sources are in a little bit. Let's follow this rabbit hole for just a second. But then we'll come back to the Lambda resource, I promise. Okay, so high level on this resource is that it will create the zip file for us. We set it to create a zip file, point it to a directory that needs zipping, and a place to put the resulting zip file. This last line just makes sure that another resource runs before this, specifically this one up here. Now the reason we want this resource to run first is that this makes sure everything we want to zip up is in the directory that we pointed to. Okay. A null resource is a resource that can run any number of shell scripts, AWS CLI commands, or just generally fill in the gaps that other resources can't do on their own. In this case, we will be executing a bash script called build.sh. We need to give it some environment variables here, like the directory name and the Lambda Python file. We will need to rerun this whenever we have a file change or make an update to our Python code, so we'll have some triggers on key files here. It's basically the same thing as we did up here, so if the hash of any of these files is different from the last time we ran this, it'll rerun this null resource. Now if we take a look inside our build.sh script file, we will first export some variables. This first one sets the working directory, then these two are just the Python file we set up earlier, 
and the directory with all the packages. As you can see, I included a bunch of print statements throughout so we can monitor the script's progress. Okay, so first we delete the old zip directory, create a new one, and a temporary directory. Next, we install everything in our requirements.txt file, which currently only holds our Alpaca trade API, into the temporary directory. Now, since one of the limitations of a zip lambda is that the uploaded zip file can't be larger than 50 megabytes, you heard that right, we run into issues uploading the whole package into our zip file. So through some trial and error, I found some that we can remove and still keep our API intact, as well as keep the zip file under the 50 megabyte limit. Again, this is why I would recommend you guys trying the container route, because your uploaded size limit for a container is 10 gigabytes instead of our measly 50 megabytes. Anyway, after copying the files that we need to use the Python package, we copy our Python file and clean up by deleting the temporary directory. Okay, so now that we've gone down that rabbit hole, we can climb all the way back up to the Lambda resource we started with. From the build.sh file, back to the null resource that calls it, to the archive data source that depends on that, and finally back to our Lambda. We'll touch on what IAM is in a second, but let's finish off the rest of this Lambda function first. So we point to the handler function in the trading Lambda Python file we went through earlier, set the runtime to Python 3.7, set the memory size, and give us the max timeout possible. This is in seconds, so we have 15 minutes for this Lambda to finish running, or else it will time out and not finish. This is just a limitation of Lambdas in general, so if you think you might need more than 15 minutes to execute your trading strategy, you might want to look into either an EC2 instance or you can refer to my previous video and use a Raspberry Pi. Next is a layer, which is basically a package or library you want to include with a Lambda. In our case, we will include a pre-built pandas layer with our Lambda because it will include some libraries that we'll need. Lastly, here is where we provide our environment variables we accessed in our Python code earlier. This first one is a variable, which again, we stored in the variables.tf file, and the rest are data sources, which are stored in data.tf. Data sources are just resources that reference things built outside of Terraform. In our case, these resources are going to be built manually later on in Systems Manager using the AWS CLI and referenced here like so. Almost done. Only a few more concepts to go through and we can try running this. Lastly for the Lambda, we have the IAM role we skipped over earlier, which references a resource in a file aptly called IAM.tf. IAM stands for Identity and Access Management. Basically, this will allow your resource customized permissions to other AWS services. What's also nice is that this service is offered at no additional cost, so we're still good on that front. So let's start with the role itself. We have a name and a role policy. Notice that there are two policy documents, the first of which is a trust policy, and the second is a permissions policy. The trust policy is a JSON policy document in which you define the principles that you trust to assume the role. And the principles that you can specify in the trust policy include users, roles, accounts, and services. In our case, we are assuming the Lambda service. Now the permissions policy is a bit different here we define what actions and resources the role can use, and then we attach this to the role. In our case, we are allowing the role to create log streams and then put log events into CloudWatch for us. We'll touch on CloudWatch next, but that's it for the IAM code. Okay, as I just mentioned, the last service we're going to use is called CloudWatch. It's a service for setting alarms, visualizing logs, taking automated actions, and troubleshooting issues. In our application, we'll use it for two things. The first use is to invoke the Lambda itself, based on some rules we can define here. I included a more complex schedule as an example, and I'll include a link to this documentation page with further examples, so you guys can customize the schedule that works for you. But for now, I'll keep it simple and just have this Lambda run every five minutes. Next, we'll need to point this towards the Lambda and give it permission to invoke the Lambda. The second and final use for CloudWatch we'll be utilizing is its ability to log our output from the Lambda. We simply create the CloudWatch log group here and set it to expire in two weeks to make sure we don't keep too many logs. Let's take a peek at the pricing for CloudWatch to make sure we're still in the clear. So CloudWatch has an always free tier and looks like the event we're going to use to kick off the Lambda is included. For logs, we have a five gigabyte free limit. Whether or not we come close to this will really depend on how many logs your project is generating and how often you're deleting the old logs. Remember, we set it to automatically delete logs over two weeks old, but you can always tweak that as needed. That's it for the Terraform code. 
But before we deploy this, we still have to manually add the environment variables to Systems Manager. As we can see here in the documentation, standard parameters are available at no additional charge, so we're still in the clear. Of course, if you want these to be advanced parameters, or you want to enable a higher throughput, it will come with additional costs. To add these parameters, simply log into the AWS console, navigate to Systems Manager, and click Parameter Store. As you can see, I already have mine created, but I'll go ahead and delete one just to go through the process and show how it's done. These are the four parameters I used in the example repository, but you're welcome to use more or less parameters, as long as you keep it below 10,000 or else you'll start to get charged. It'll be up to you to balance what to keep in variables or environment files versus parameters, but I would recommend using parameters for things you wouldn't want to commit to your repository, such as secret keys, for example. So let's delete this one and recreate it by hitting create parameter, enter the name and value, and you can add whatever description or tags you want. And when you're done, hit create parameter. All right, there you see it. It's newly created and ready for use. All right, let's navigate to our project in the command line and type in terraform init to initialize the project. This will create the terraform state files locally, which will track the state of the AWS infrastructure for you. Once that's done, we can type in terraform plan to see what resources will be created. Here we can see nine resources will be built, zero to change and zero to destroy. Finally, we can type in terraform apply. And when prompted, if we're sure, we type in yes. This will start building all our resources and we can start to see them show up in the AWS console. This might take a few minutes, but once it's done, we can go check that our Lambda exists. Yep, there it is. And we can check the logs in CloudWatch and the log group should exist. But as we can see, there aren't any logs just yet since we set the Lambda to be kicked off every five minutes. And of course, if we check Alpaca, we can see that there hasn't been any orders submitted yet. Side note, I'm using the paper trading API from Alpaca for this demo but you can change this at any time by just changing the base URL. I have the URL set in Systems Manager, so if at any time I want to take it live, I can just tweak that slightly. I would also have to change the key and secret key, of course, but that's all it would really take to change this from paper trading to live trading. Anyways, looks like our Lambda is now over five minutes old, so we should see an order submitted by now. If we check CloudWatch, we see there are now logs for our Lambda running. Looks like it printed out our print statements, as expected, and submitted the order for us. Let's go check Alpaca to confirm. Hooray! Look at that. We just submitted an order for free using AWS. Now we can always monitor the various services we're using and make sure we're under the free usage limits by heading to the Cost Explorer in the AWS console. Here we can see which services are being used and how much they're costing you. You can set a budget as well. I have one here that'll email me if I ever go over my $5 budget so I can come in and see what's happening. I highly recommend everyone look through these as they can be really helpful in staying under the free tier limits and minimizing costs as much as possible. Now, if you want to remove all of the resources we just deployed to AWS, there is a simple Terraform command for that as well. It's called Terraform Destroy. And just like before, you just type yes when prompted. Once it's done, you can look through AWS to confirm the resources are gone. Yep. Looks like the Lambda isn't there anymore, and that's all there is to it. Now, by no means is this a production-ready project. More of a showcase that using AWS and Terraform to trade stocks for free is possible. This example code can serve as a launching off point to create a project that you, the user, can be satisfied with. There are many ways to improve this project, such as using Terraform workspaces, storing the state files remotely in S3, using Secrets Manager instead of SSM, and using a container lambda just to name a few. These may bring further costs though, so be mindful of that and make sure to check the free tiers and prices of every service you start to use. Anyway, thank you so much to everyone still watching and happy coding. If you haven't already, check out my previous video on how to trade stocks on a Raspberry Pi and remember to hit that subscribe button. Thanks.